to give a talk on uh, electric policies. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's my pleasure to be talking to you today. I'm going to talk um, uh, mostly about electric catalysis and, and primarily as it applies to fuel cells. Uh, however, um, I've got enough of a background that I can answer other questions in other areas. Um, the talk is going to be focused a little bit more on the research that we do in this area at NREL. Um, but what I'm hoping is, is that it gives you an idea of some of the key issues and what people are looking at and how electric catalysis is interesting and important. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what's talked about here in terms of extended surface catalysis. Um, it's a trend certainly within the fuel cell community um, to try to make structures that have longer lengths. And you'll see it in other applications as well, such as advanced solar devices. So um, coming to a place like this and even to talk to a group like you, I always talk about um, different teaching opportunities. Uh, here's part of my old CV that doesn't include any of my work at NREL. Uh, I've been at NREL for the last four and a half years as um, the group manager of the fuel cell group. Uh, my PhD thesis was actually in polymers, and I'm giving you a talk instead in catalysis. And so what I have up here is some background about how I started doing polymers. And then what happened is, is that I figured out that the critical limitation for fuel cells wasn't actually polymers. It was actually catalysis. Uh, I'll show some slides about how the cost is the limiting factor, how the durability is the limiting factor. And then basically, as a guy who had a polymer background, how did I apply it to electric catalysis? Really, I did three things. Uh, the first was I started to look at alkaline polymers instead of acidic polymers. Most fuel cells are based on naphthene, which is an acidic polymer. Um, and if you could switch that to an alkaline polymer, you'd solve the polymer, you'd solve the catalysis problem by having a polymer solution. The second is by looking at the electrode. So I'll talk to you a lot about electrode design and electrode structure because it's a critical part of making the catalysis and the entire devices work. Uh, the last thing is, is just to become an electric catalysis person. So what for the last few years, I've actually done that as well. Um, but basically, I throw this up just to show the dynamic needs of, um, you know, research doesn't care what your educational background is, and the, the devices and the problems don't care. Uh, you have to adjust as you go through. So um, I know Hewan came and gave a talk to this group on fuel cells. So um, basically, I'm not going to talk much about fuel cells at all. But what I'll do is uh, I'll talk about what the electric catalysis part of this is. Um, in fuel cells, we feed in fuels and they come out, and in um, hydrogen production, solar devices, or other types of things, you'll have the same type of thing. You'll have catalysts, they'll be responsible for reactions, and what happens in a fuel cell is you bring in something like hydrogen, you bring in oxygen. At these catalyst surfaces, you have interactions, and it's called the triple phase boundary in the electrodes, and so I'll go through that a little bit more. And then you have something that separates the reaction, uh, and so you end up doing basically burning of hydrogen, but since you do it in two steps, you do it more efficiently, you can avoid the carnal cycle and you can do one for other things. Uh, the electrodes are key parts of this, so the first part of this, I'll talk a little bit about the electrodes. And what I try to do is I try to give lots of pictures. Um, it makes it easier for me and hopefully it makes it easier for you. Um, and so typically in these devices and in a lot of the um, renewable energy devices right now, I would consider a lot of their architectures to be very empirical. So if you think about uh, microchips today um, and how layered they are and how many, how well architectured they are, even down to the nanoscale, when you talk about things in the renewable energy area, what you find is, is that they're more like um, more vocal processes, where here we have a catalyst ink. It's just a mixture of a liquid, catalyst particles, and a polymer. And what we do is we basically mix it up and it's been empirically optimized. So there's been tons of different, there's been a lot of different work that's been gone into. If we change this a little bit, if we change that a little bit, what happens? But as far as kind of like a lithographic process where you're building architectures back out that have very well-defined features at the nanoscale, certainly in this area of science and other areas of science, they're much less common. Um, and so what happens here is you take this ink mixture, you put it on a decal or you can put it right on the membrane and you basically dry it, you hot press it, and then what you have is you have a membrane electrode assembly. And so your catalysis, your polymer, all of it is in the same place. It's formed this complex three-phase interface, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it in some of the pictures. Um, but what goes in between it is the membrane, and it has some requirements. And I don't need to talk about the membrane because I'm focused on the electrodes and the, um, the catalyst. Um, but these types of requirements are what's required. So I, I talked a little bit 
about how um, I was a polymer person doing work on fuel cells, and then what happened was I basically saw a picture like this where you can see where the cost of the fuel cells are and that half of the cost is in the catalyst. And so because of that, um, you know, so, so, so before I go on, right now I'm the acting center director for the Hydrogen, Systems Technolo Hydrogen Technologies and Systems Center at NRL. Um, one of the big things that happened in the past few years was that there's actually been kind of a negative turn for fuel cells. Um, so I started doing fuel cell work when I was um, just a beginning graduate student, and at the time nobody understood what a fuel cell was, and I had to explain it to everybody. And I had a number of people who I went to school with who said, oh, you're in great position because fuel cells will always be a, gener a technology that will be five or ten years away. And they've been five or ten years away for the last 30, 40 years. And what's happened for me as somebody who's been on the front of the research, I always thought that there were problems that might not be addressed that would actually be a problem that would keep them from being implemented. Uh, but three or four years ago, I actually realized that now they actually are five or ten years away, whereas back in the 90s um, when I started doing some of this, they always seemed like they were infinitely far away and we could keep doing research on them forever. So there's places like, you know, so right now there's 150 fuel cell vehicles on the road in the U.S. Um, and GM, Honda, Daimler all have the ability, uh, all have the Toyota, they all have the ability to put tens of thousands of these vehicles on the road in the next handful of years. Now, a lot of this comes down to the politics in the chicken and egg situation. Right now, the car companies are saying, we can't buy, we can't build fuel cell vehicles because we won't buy, build a vehicle if you don't have a place to fuel it. And the people who would actually have to put in the hydrogen fueling stations say, we don't want to put in hydrogen fueling stations until we have vehicles to sell them. So there's this chicken and egg problem where everybody's pointing their fingers at each other. But from somebody who's on the front line of the science of this, um, in 2003, I put together a workshop for the DOE, and at that time, freeze problems were what everybody was concerned about because one of the great things about fuel cells is they only make water, but one of the bad things about fuel cells is they only make water, and if you want to live in Minnesota and start the car in winter, you have this problem about you're only making water, and your temperatures are so low compared to an internal combustion engine. Uh, by about 2005 or 2006, it was clear that places like GM had engineered the freeze problem. So freeze was no longer a problem, it was no longer a critical limitation. You can take these vehicles and down to minus 30 degrees, they'll start. Um, and that's basically as good as an internal combustion engine can do. So they still have some issues because they have water, but basically freeze was taken away. The second problem that everybody was concerned about, and this had gone on forever, was platinum. And so about three years ago, the engineering of the devices got to the point where the platinum loadings were about four times what you have in your catalytic converter today. And now the next generation that comes out in like the 2015 time frame will just have twice as much precious metal in it as your current catalytic converters do. And there's a, there's a path to basically the same amount of platinum as you have in your catalytic converter today. And so now it's seen that there's no longer technological limitations that prevent it. There's still some cost limitations and if, for people who are interested I'm more than happy to talk about it. But um, what was most frustrating to me when I first came to NREL, um, and I, at that time I had, I had been leading the Department of Energy's largest fuel cell group in Los Alamos National Lab, and I moved to NREL because it had a stronger tie to renewable energy in a broader sense, rather than a weapons lab. And I came here and I thought um, everything was going to be very good for fuel cells, but um, the politics of the day actually turned the direction. So as a frontline researcher, who just basically had seen that the critical problems that he thought were going to prevent the technology from ever getting through looked like they had solutions from a technical perspective, was the same time that politics came in and said, we're going to go a different way with this. And so, um, you know, be aware that, you know, as scientists, it's our job to put data forth and to make sure we're lobbying in the right ways. And part of this little preaching is basically to let you know that as a frontline researcher in this, there aren't real technological problems that prevent fuel cells from becoming the vehicles of the future. There's what the costs of them are, and they're you know, roughly on par. Um, the only real drivers to get out of some of these um, internal combustion devices are basically environmental, and how you ever put an economic value on the environmental end of this is really a question. But there's at least not the technological problems or the huge cost barriers that come with other technologies. So that's a little um, preaching.
um, on fuel cells, but something that I think is useful for me to share. So the platinum is still the major issue because obviously, um, even if we take lots of this cost out, it's the biggest driver. And um, the other thing is, is that from, an, from a national perspective, because you know I'm funded by taxpayers at the Department of Energy, through the Department of Energy, um, we don't want to trade dependence on crude oil from the Middle East or from other places for dependence on platinum from other potentially, geo potentially unstable areas, uh, South Africa or, or Russia. Um, and so there's two ends of what I'll talk about in electric catalysis. One is kind of just the traditional standard electric catalysis. And then the other is an extended surface concept, which is one of the things that we at NREL do a decent amount of work on particularly as, they oppose, as they're um, related to fuel cells. Um, so I, I should have got pictures up here first. So platinum on carbon is a typical electric catalyst, and I'll show pictures of those. And so by 3D catalysts, um, I'll talk about extended surfaces. I don't mean platinum on carbon. They can have small nanoparticles, um, but they can have longer length scales. And actually, there's a big push within the community to go to what they call extended surface catalysts. Um, and a lot of what I'll talk about is what an extended surface catalyst is. Um, what's well known is, is that a small piece of platinum, like a two nanometer particle on carbon, has a very low activity for each platinum site on the surface. However, when you get a sheet of platinum, each platinum site on the surface is about an order of magnitude more active. And so the question is, is why when you have platinum in a large sheet, is it more than an order of magnitude more active than all of these small particles? And that's what we'll do. Um, and so there's a number of different electrocatalyst pathways that people are pursuing, and so I'm going to just talk about them um, within the fuel cell context. Because fuel cells have been so limiting in terms of the, cat the catalysis and the performance, what you'll see is, is a lot of these concepts are going to move forward to like solar fuels devices and other types of things as well. So the typical catalyst is actually just platinum car on carbon, your nanoparticles. They look like this. You have these large carbon particles and you have these small pieces of platinum on it. Um, what they do is, is they basically try to go to a lot of platinum on the surface. So if you have small particles, more of your platinum's on the surface, whereas if you have large particles, you have less platinum on the surface. And so people do different things with this. The first thing they do is they make alloys. There's a number of alloys that are shown to make this more active. And then they do things like de-alloying them. They try to make core shells where they just try to decorate the outside of one particle with platinum on the outside. Um, and then the extended surfaces is, is, is the last one that's up there. The extended surfaces are basically shown here. Uh, ideally, you'd think of like a model thin film, something like a monolayer. And um, there's other groups who basically do a lot of this where they have you know, a monolayer overcoat on top of an alloy and it show very high surface areas. And um, I promise lots of pictures. Um, these are examples of different types of um, catalysts that are being developed for fuel cells. Uh, these are 3M nanoparticles. These are extended surfaces. This is some of our collaborators at the University of Delaware who make these nanotubes. So we make them at Enrel as well. A group at Brookhaven makes these kind of um, spindly, wiry um, platinum structures. And then we've put other things on it at NREL, like onto nanotubes and other types of structures. So I talked a little bit about the electrode history. What you can see is that up until about the 1960s, fuel cells only had one application, and it was space. And it was space because they needed tens of milligrams of platinum per square centimeter. And so what they did is they took just platinum black and they steam bonded it to membranes uh, with a Teflon binder. And then in the late 80s and early 90s, um, two researchers, um, Malin Wilson, somebody who I interacted with quite a bit at Los Alamos while I was there, and Ian Raystrick, who was gone before I got there, um, basically came up with two major breakthroughs, which was dispersing the platinum on carbon and then integrating it with ionomer into electrode structures. And basically, these tens of milligrams per square centimeter got reduced down to um, tenths of milligrams per square centimeter. And then all of a sudden, everybody got really excited about what you could do with these things on the planet. And um, at that point in time, GM actually took a group and went to Los Alamos to work with these researchers. And now that group forms the electrochemical engine division at GM in Huntingway Falls. 
Uh, in the mid-90s, there was some work done at 3M, particularly on non-structured electrodes, but really, they're empirically optimized structures for these electrodes, and you're trying to get them uh, better. So, uh, I don't know if you have another talk on catalysis um, during this um, tutorial, um, you know, but, but catalysts are really straightforward, and I think that most people here understand what a catalyst is. You know, they lower energy barriers, and then they're not consumed as part of any reaction. Um, you know, a lot of times in the organic system, they're homogeneous and they're dispersed throughout a liquid phase. But they can also be heterogeneous and they're used all the time. I'm a chemical engineer by training, and in refinery processes, um, heterogeneous catalysis is basically what makes the world run. Uh, there's also photocatalytic um, catalyst, catalysis and electrocatalysis. I'm talking about electrocatalysis. So what electrocatalysis needs is something a little bit more than just what any of the other systems need. Um, and I have basically here a textbook picture of an electrode structure from a fuel cell, and I use it so that I can highlight what the requirements of an electrode catalyst are in these systems. And so what you have is you have these platinum particles which are actually the catalysts, but it's not enough just to have the catalyst. In a homogeneous system where you're feeding in like um, two gas phase reactants, all you need is a metal surface. The gas phase reactants find the surface, react, and then go away. In this case, what happens is, is that you have to get the reactants in the products out, and that's the same. But you also need electron conduction. And what I have here is, is these are platinum on carbon. So these blue outlines that Karen Moore at Oak Ridge put on these micrographs um, show basically, you, you can see these turbostratic sheets of graphene um, that are basically um, the carbon particle. And then you see the platinum on top of it. And then you see this thin skin of ionomer. And so this is nathion, and that's an ion conducting polymer. So for a fuel cell, you have one of the most complex situations because at this reaction site, they have what they call a triple phase boundary. And the triple phase boundary is this. You have to be able to get the reaction reactants in. You have to get the products out. You have to get the electrons in or the electrons out. And this is where the electronic conducting pathway through the carbon takes place. And then you have to get the ions to move around to make their, their, their complete the circuit. And that's where this thin skin of ionomer is. There's a lot of catalysis applications similar to this where you wouldn't need an ionomer because you'd be doing it in a liquid solution. Um, and you could put acid in the liquid solution. But in a fuel cell, you have the most complicated version of this because you have to have this thin ionomer skin because you need it for the ion conduction. But if it gets too thick, what happens is the ions can't, or, or the reactants can't get in and the products get, are slow getting out, so you have a lot of mass transfer problems. Um, this, is, this is my favorite micrograph that I've ever seen, and, and really, uh, this came out in about 2004 or so, and as microscopy's gotten better and better, uh, it's really allowed us to visualize what were basically conceptual things beforehand. Uh, I've seen hundreds of these types of pictures. This is the only one that looks like this. This is likely the one that you'd see in the textbook, but it is very unrepresentative of what happens. These are more of the representative pictures, and this comes to a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of electrocatalysis and what a lot of the issues are. And it comes down to, in fuel cells in particular, we have to have a support material. So carbon's put into these because we can't afford to have as much platinum in it. However, the platinum to carbon bond is very weak, and it's, that's highlighted here. So what you have here is you have a bunch of carbon particles and you can pick them out if you go around them. And then these really dark particles, they are um, platinum particles. And then you have these ionomer webs. And so this is basically the ion conducting polymer that allows the protons to move around. But what you can see is, is that when you do this, you have a bunch of these particles here in the webs that don't have any electronic contact. So they're, they're basically dead. They're, they're isolated, they can't see electrons, they're not connected to the matrix. And so what happens is, is if things come in, they can heterogeneously react there, but then you can't harvest the energy, so it doesn't do you any good. And what you need them to do is be connected to these larger conducting networks. And a large part of the problem in today's fuel cells is, is there's just too much of this waste and catalysis catalyst around. So if we could basically harvest this catalyst better, it would be good. And the second thing is, is, that, okay, is that even if you can see some of these things, um, over here you can see small particles, and I may have a better picture of this coming up. Um, they may still see this electronically, but they're not being utilized as well as they could. And so a lot of this comes down to why are we getting the activities we get. So one of the studies um, 
that I performed while I was at Los Alamos was basically looking at the effect of sonication times on these materials. And what you can see up here is just a normal platinum carbon particle. Uh, no ionomer, no aging, no anything. And then what happens is, is that when you actually mix it with ionomer and you do it kind of in the standard way, you end up with dispersions of platinum that look fairly similar to the material that started. Um, there's a little bit of uh, ionomer webbing here and not all of the platinum's in the best places. But if I keep doing this for another five and a half hours and sonicating, what I see is, is that the ionomer keeps moving around the surface of the polymer. It drags all of these particles into, um, you know, kind of the places in between the agglomerates. And the electrode structures for these things aren't the same either. So it densifies the electrodes. This white space, these fractal patterns, are basically the pore space, and the, solid, the darks are the solids. And this is what happens for a typical electrode, and this is what happens when the electrode is sonicated for a longer time. These structures are extremely important for getting the reactants in and getting the products out. Uh, and what happens is, is that they change between the two as well as where the platinum is. And so this is basically a reflection of the weakness of the carbon-platinum bond, which is going to be a recurring theme for the rest of what I talk about. So this is my second favorite um, high-resolution transition. My, uh, trend, transition electron microscope image. And again, what Karen Moore has done here is she basically outlines where the carbon particles are. And then this area here is the ionomer, which is the polymer that's required for the ion transport. And what you can see here is, is that there's some of these particles where I know that they're probably electronically connected. But then as you move further and further out into this ionomer, you have to worry more and more about the connection. And so there's two levels of this. There's what you can see by cyclic voltammetry, which is the experiment that you run to basically see how much catalyst you have available. And how that would happen if you were actually running this under load and under power. Because in a cyclic voltammogram where you can actually just see each surface site, uh, you run these things over the periods of minutes, and each surface site only has to turn over once. Whereas if you talk about actually turning this over under operating conditions in a fuel cell for a vehicle, each surface site would have to turn over a thousand times about an average. So the difference between turning over a site once per two minutes versus turning every, every site every millisecond is a huge difference. And the resistance of the pathway to electron transport becomes much more important. And so within the, the electrocatalysis community, there's this belief about um, particle size effects, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And the question is, is are they really particle size effects, or are they really just an artifact of how these things are put together and what they do. So at NREL, what we have is a number of different programs to basically take on the weakness of the platinum carbon bond. And we do this in two ways. The first way is through catalyst support interactions. So we know that the platinum carbon bond is really weak, and so we're trying to improve that. And so what we do is we've looked at a number of different carbons, and we use high, highly oriented pyrolytic graphite as a model system. And if you look up here, you can see this is what happens when you put platinum ruthenium down on highly HOPG. Uh, but when you nitrogen dope it, instead of getting these um, depositions that are much larger and only follow the defects in the surface, you actually can uniformly put the catalyst across the surface. Uh, so this was a two-year project we had at NREL that included a number of subcontractors. And we could take the same type of an approach and instead of doing it on flat model surfaces that would allow us to investigate what was going on with catalysis, we could actually put them onto um, carbon particles that were actually more relevant for doping into or, or putting into electrodes. And what we saw was is that we could basically meet the performance of state-of-the-art platinum ruthenium catalysts through this type of a doping approach. Now, the the key part of this is, is that, yeah, so we were able to do nitrogen doping, we were able to meet the performance. That's really not all that interesting or that compelling. It just means that we were able to do what Johnson Matthew could already do. Um, and so what we did was we looked at how much nitrogen in the surface made a difference on our performance. And these are just micrographs that show different implantation times from zero to five seconds up to 100 seconds for nitrogen doping by ion implantation. And so you look at these things and you say from a, a flat HOPG standpoint, the initial materials and the initial surfaces are about identical. But then what we could do is we could actually run these over periods of time where we cycled them. And what we found was is that 
higher amounts of nitrogen resulted in much better retaining of the surface area and the particles. And this is basically based on the fact that the nitrogen adhere, the nitrogen doping in the surface caused the platen to adhere better to the surface. So in these cases, we had more migration and dissolution and reprecipitation, and particularly migration. And as you got to higher levels of nitrogen content, you had a very positive impact on stability in that the platinum particles weren't as free to move around on the surface. We have another project, and I think I just have one slide on this, where we're looking at replacements for carbon. So, I mean, if the carbon to platinum bond being weak is a problem, you can either try to make that bond stronger, or you can try to replace the carbon with something that's a better linker. In this project, we're actually looking at tungsten oxide or heteropoly acids. And so what we have here is we have um, these atoms here, which are heteropoly acids. They're um, phosphotungstic acid or phosphomolybdic acid. And they're basically one little ball of um, tungsten oxide that basically we covalently bond to the carbon. So we have a strong bond between the carbon and this particle. And the premise is, is that this particle will actually anchor the platinum stronger than the carbon does. And so most of what, is, so, so these are, those were both projects that um, happen on my team but are led by other people. I'll spend most of my time basically talking about uh, what the extended surface project that I'm the PI for is. And so within our project, which includes a lot of university and a few national lab and, and, and several industry sub well, collaborators or subcontractors, we have two thrusts. One is it's on the synthesis of novel catalysts based on extended surfaces. And this is largely based on 3M's work, and I'll talk about what 3M's done and, and how, what they've shown in a minute. And the second is, is that, you know, putting these things into electrodes and actually giving them structures that allow them to function properly. Because um, there's been a lot of people who've actually made materials that seem like they're absolutely great materials, but they are ineffectual when you actually try to stick them into a system and make them work. So within this, I'll talk about specific activity and durability advantages. And so um, 3M has a material that's called NSTF. It's a nanostructured thin film. It's one of the darlings of the fuel cell community in that it's shown extremely good performance. And so to come back and re-discuss some of the things I talked about earlier, here's some references from other places where basically you can look here, and this is the activity of a platinum site when it's in a thin film. So these are basically big disks of platinum. And what you see here is, is when you have that, a platinum site is extremely active, about two milliamps per, per square centimeter. If you go to platinum black, which is in a collection of small agglomerates, that number drops a lot. And if you go to what typically is used in a fuel cell, you're about an order of magnitude lower with this platinum on carbon than this platinum in a flat sheet. And the question becomes, why is that? Beyond that, 3M has also shown that when you stick these things into fuel cells, unlike some other materials, they actually have an incredibly stable and long durability performance. So, so a lot of these are actually falling off very quickly here. Um, but their product, because of its extended surface, has not only high specific activity, but exceptional durability. Uh, here's pictures of what 3M's material look like. Um, you know, you can take some of these arguments, and they have this huge specific activity. It's about 10 times higher than these small particles, but they have a problem. And so if, if I look at these materials and I do the math on them, basically I can assume that they're about a 12 and a half nanometer platinum coating on a 50 nanometer core cylinder. So that's about 29 shells of platinum that has a surface roughness of about two. And so only about 5% of the platinum is actually on the surface. So even though these have extremely high specific activities of each surface atom, they don't have very many of the atoms on the surface, only one in 20. When you look at this typical approach, what you have is you have two nanometer cuboctahedron particles. And even though they're one tenth the specific activity, they only have about five platinum shells, and that means that almost half of the platinum, or right around half of the platinum is actually on the surface. So when you talk about the mass activities of these things, which is really what you care about, because you care about how much you have to put into how well it does, what you actually find is, is that these specific activities and these mass activity, the mass activities are about the same, because the specific activity in the electrochemical surface area is cancel with each other. And so the question is, is can we take these advantages here of the specific activity, but instead of come up with surface areas that are only about 5% of the platinum on the surface, 
can we increase them to numbers that are like this without losing that performance or get to half of that number of something else and still maintain it? Uh, and so at MREL and, and with some of our subcontractors, we make a whole bunch of novel platinum nanostructures. Uh, these are platinum nanotubes. These are platinum on carbon nanotubes. These are platinum freestanding nanotubes. Uh, we have um, uh, nano plates as well. Um, and so we make a lot of these materials. And our focus is really on increasing the electrochemical area. Um, and so typically these extended surfaces have areas as low as 10 meters squared per gram. We typically make them at about 50 meters squared per gram. So we're actually increasing how much surface area of platinum we have by a factor of five. In doing so, we're actually taking some specific activity hits, but we only lose about a factor of two. And so overall, we can get an increase in mass activity. We also look at putting these things into electrodes effectively and do modeling to support it. So we've looked at a number of different platinum templates uh, for de deposition. Um, we've looked at metal templates, and so we've done things like synthesized copper nanowires, silver nanowires, silver nanoplates. Uh, here's an example of one. We use nanotubes or graphene or other types of things as templates. Here's some examples of vertically aligned carbon nanotubes that we synthesized. We've looked at metal oxides. Um, these are ones that were synthesized. Um, these are silicon nanowires um, that are titanium coated uh, that were synthesized at Albany. And then we've also looked at 3M's whiskers, and these are the materials that I showed from 3M, um, but we've tried to coat them at lower levels that would allow us to have not as wa much wasted platinum. Um, and then finally, we look at different deposition routes. We've looked at vapor deposition, and these things have included evaporation, um, chemical vapor deposition, and pulse laser deposition. The two main ones that we've actually focused on are sputtering, or atomic layer deposition, and here's basically what happens in atomic layer deposition. The idea is, is that by having controlled reactants deposited in, in specific ways, that you can potentially put monolayer by monolayer of platinum down as you work forward. And then within solution deposition, we've looked at um, spontaneous galvanic displacement primarily, although we've looked at like electrochemical spontaneous under deposition as well. So with sputtering, uh, this is what 3M uses to make their products. And we focused on carbon nanotube mats where we actually have, we've seen these continuous coatings. Now, uh, you can see by looking at this that we're getting about a two nanometer coating on these and this would be absolutely ideal. The problem is, is that in most lab experiments, you can't generate enough quantity with enough quality of reproducibility to make this. 3M makes theirs in a roll by roll, a roll to roll process. Um, and they've got these large buttering chambers and these large vacuum chambers that allow them to do meters of this stuff um, per minute. Um, if you have such a system and you have quality control like they do, it's possible to do things like this. Uh, for us, the scale up to basically do that has cost so much that we're basically leaving a lot of the sputtering approaches to 3M. However, it's the only approach based on what they've done and based on some of the things that we've seen that allows you to basically put these types of thin coatings down at like the single nanometer level on things like carbon nanotubes. ALD is what we had hoped we could do with this. Um, however, our best coatings so far have been in the six nanometer range as far as conformally coating. And to actually get to the mass activity targets we want, we have to get down to one or two nanometers of platinum coating. And so this is work that was done at Stanford uh, as part of our project. Um, where they're looking at platinum deposition on different surfaces. And from these, at 100 cycles of ALD, um, we were only able to get the coating that we could measure in thickness on titanium. And so because of this, we understand which types of materials uh, we want to focus on. And this really comes down to how poorly platinum wants to wet other materials and how that becomes a problem in terms of making electrocatalysts that you want um, with, with the right types of and so I think I'm going to end up going through a few of the different templates that we use. So here are examples of our silver nanowires and, and our silver nanoplates and our copper nanowires. Um, we've made them with different materials and we've made them with different sizes and shapes. Um, this brings us to galvanic displacement, which is one of the techniques um, that's not commonly used that we use specifically to make novel materials. And galvanic displacement is based on the premise over here that different metals have different reduction oxidation potentials. 
And so basically, the higher you go on this list, the more noble you are. And so that means that if you wanted to take something like copper, which is something that we commonly do, and you added platinum ions to solution, what would slowly happen here, and our silver would be another example, we start out with silver nanowires, and then by putting it in a platinum ion containing solution, you'll eventually end up with platinum nanotubes typically. Now, it doesn't always have to be a, a transition from like a wire to a tube. Uh, there's been a number of works in the literature where they've taken small silver particles, they've put them in gold, which is the most noble of the metals, and you can start with a sphere basically of silver, and you can end up with a hollow sphere of gold, something that's close to spherical and dense that's gold, a porous gold sphere, a porous hollow gold sphere, or even a, a hollow cube. So depending on the different reactions you, reactants you put in the reactant conditions, you can basically start with something like this and make these structures. Um, you might be able to make this structure directly, but none of these other structures could you actually make directly from silver. So this is a nice indirect way to make structures that you can't make in any other way. So we've done a lot of this. And so this is basically just a picture to say that we've done lots of synthesis and this is what it looks like. Um, We've looked at what happens when you change um, temperature and reactant delivery method. We looked at what's happened when you do template morphologies. We looked at when you switch template metals. We looked at the effect of ligands and the displacement salts. Um, and we've looked at different displacement metals. Um, typically, we're doing it with platinum because we care about fuel cells. Um, but you could do it with palladium. You could do it with iridium. You could do it with gold. Gold is really the most common one in the literature. And then you could do it at different dis extents of displacement. Here's an example where we only have 6% of platinum. This is 42% platinum, and that's 85% platinum. And so we can make a lot of materials, but what does it mean in terms of electrochemical performance? Um, the first thing to see over here is, is that these materials that we make, this is platinum on carbon in terms of its specific activity or a measure of how active each platinum site is. Here's polycrystalline platinum, which is about an order of magnitude more active. And when we make these types of structures, what we find is, is that we're much more active per platinum site than we were for the platinum on carbon, but we tend to be only about half as active as the polycrystalline platinum. When we first started these studies, what we found was is that getting a high specific activity, which is on this axis, was relatively easily, but getting a high surface area was actually fairly difficult. And so we spent our, a lot of our initial time on this scale going from low surface areas and low activity up to high activities but low surface areas. And then what we found was we found a way to basically do our processing so that we gave up some of the specific activity, but we greatly improved our electrochemical surface area. And today, we pretty much primarily get surface areas and points that are in this range. Now this plot is put this way because what you really care about is the most mass activity you can get. And so this is basically the status of mass activity now. This is kind of what you can get in a single cell level. And this is what DOE thinks you need to make cars viable. And so right now, we get plenty of things that come in this range, and, and some of them actually get above this line. But in this graph, what you want to do is you want to go to this direction. 3M's done it by trying to go very, very high here. And the typical catalysts go by being way out over here. But they're low here and low here. Our projects really, in our work, primarily tries to take on this in-between range and get something in that specific batch. And so these are examples. Um, basically, the target is now 440 milliamps per milligram of platinum. We get 450 milliamps per milligram of platinum, and we're always kind of very close to this 400 range, so very close to what the targets are. And here are just examples of three, four different batches that we've made um, from silver nanowires to platinum nanotubes. And you can see that depending on the precursor material, you can get very different properties and very different um, structures, um, things that look very different by microscopy. Now, if you actually start including carbon with some of these things, because you don't, you're going to need to in electrodes to basically dilute them, what happens is you get structures that look like this, and then you have um, basically dispersions that will start looking like this, where we've introduced gra graphitized carbon nanofibers in with the um, platinum nanowires or nanotubes. And so without the carbon, we're getting a much lower surface area. Once you put the carbon in, we're basically utilizing the surfaces better and getting higher surface areas. And uh, better mass transfer would also be expected. So we've used a number of these materials in 
um, electrodes and in fuel cells. Uh, the, the big take home messages here are these materials have much better durability. So basically what we do for aging these materials is we'll electrochemically cycle them. And when we electrochemically cycle them, if we take the traditional platinum on carbon, what we find is, is that it loses its surface area very quickly. Uh, however, when we take our materials, which are platinum nanotubes made from silver nanowires, what we find is, is that they retain their surface area much better. And then we put them into fuel cells, and what we find is, is that they have a problem when you go to higher current densities because their mass transfer isn't as good because we don't have optimized electrode structures. But their specific activities retain what we find in the RDE cells, which are the rotating disc electrodes, which is, is that they have a much higher activity than the standard materials. The big problem is, is, is working on getting these electrodes so that they actually have better mass transfer and actually perform well in this range out here. This goes up to 900 milliamps per square centimeter. We actually need to be between 1 and 1.5 amps per square centimeter. So um, you can see that even though these look like they should be promising, there's real problems with how you stick them into electrodes and how you architecture the electrodes. Um, and this slide somewhat highlights that. There's two different regions. Uh, this, this region here is 0.6 to 1 volts, and that's where the fuel cell stays most of the time. And what happens is, is that's a region where um, platinum dissolves and reprecipitates. So that should be seen as basically what's going on with the platinum and how platinum dissolves and reprecipitates. Now in vehicles, there's another region that's of interest and it's this carbon corrosion region. And what happens is, is when you stop a vehicle or start a vehicle, you go through a very high potential window as you're moving hydrogen and oxygen through um, the same compartment. And it causes the voltage to go up to 1 to 1.6 volts. And this is a region where carbon corrodes very readily. So one of the problems with the traditional catalyst is also the start-stop cycling. And what you see with those traditional catalysts is, is that when you start doing the start-stop, you lose a lot of the surface area again. And because we can put these together in two different ways, one is just by the wires with no carbon, and the other is basically the, the tubes with the carbon. With, in this case, you would expect that there would be no loss here because you're not actually corroding carbon. However, even when we're putting this one here, we're actually seeing that we're getting the exact same performance and no loss. And that's because in the case of a traditional platinum on carbon catalyst, you're relying on a single point attachment, and once it's corroded there, it's gone. But in these larger systems, you basically have these long tubes. And as long as you have a lot of carbon making contacts, you're no longer relying on a single site contact, and so you can corrode a lot of those contacts without actually losing any of the surface. Um, and this is just something about the mass cycle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about particle size effects and how particle size effects in catalysis, in my opinion, have been largely misinterpreted. And it, it was partially aided by what people had seen when they looked at platinum black. So I've talked about our extended surfaces, I've talked about platinum on carbon, but platinum black is another material um, that's similar in, in some ways. It's basically just small agglomerates of, it's agglomerates of small particles of platinum, so it has a very high surface area, um, but the, um, the pieces of it are bigger than um, the platinum on carbon, whereas um, platinum on carbon has a bunch of two nanometer platinums on the carbon. The platinum black is basically like five or eight nanometer pieces of uh, particles of platinum that are all connected to each other and form larger agglomerates. And so what happens is the way people test for the electrochemical activity of these materials is, is by RDE, and RDE is rotating disc electrodes. So you put down a circle of catalyst on uh, a disc that spins. And this gives you an example of platinum black at different levels of loading. And what we've done here is we kept the amount of catalyst the same by mass, but we've added carbon back in. And so this is the platinum loadings that are going down but the carbon loading is going up at the same time. And one of the problems is, is that as you start low, so you can look at a number of things. One is, is the limiting current. So the limiting current tells you if you've covered the entire disk. And you look at some of these things and you think, well, maybe we didn't cover the disk so well, but you can still see all the way out here, there's these little agglomerates, um, these really light dots. And even though here it looks like most of the stuff is concentrated here, you can still see it covering everywhere. Um, here and here, it's much more obvious that you're actually covering the entire surface. And 
you can see that you're covering the entire surface because you're actually using the entire surface when you look at the limiting currents that are obtained. Now you can look at the surface areas, which is a measure of how much platinum you can see, and you see that these really aren't changing that much either, and that really you're having about the same amount of platinum in each of these cases and the same limiting current. The real issue comes when you see how well they're performing, and you can see that here, because you have so much of this platinum meshed up together, you're not using it as effectively as this one over here or this one over here. And so these give you much lower specific activities where these give you much higher specific activities. So it's really an art of, most people would only have looked at this case and assumed that everything was fine because they had a good limiting current and they had a high surface area. But it's not until you actually do the microscopy on what you have that you see that you basically have these large clumpy areas that cause a lot of this platinum to be an average of things that are overperforming and underperforming. And so, what 3M had done with some of their work is they did loading studies. And so these loading studies in RDE are relatively common. What they do is, is you basically change how much ink you're putting down on the RDE tip, and then you measure your specific activity and your limiting current. And what happens is if you don't have enough ink, you end up not getting the full limiting current because it doesn't cover the whole area of the disk. And so you end up too high. If you put too much ink on, what happens is, is it becomes too thick and you start getting mass transfer to your catalyst sites, and so your specific activities come down. And so what you try to do is you try to get to this range where you've kind of plateaued with specific activity and you've kind of plateaued at limiting current to basically tell you, yes, you have a good ink. Now, that's what people have typically done with um, these types of surfaces, and when you do it with platinum black, you find out that you get a curve that looks like what people expect it to look like. However, there's a problem. If you add in the places where you've added carbon, what you can see is, is that you don't actually plateau where you expect to plateau. You actually keep going up this line. And that's because even though you're covering the whole surface, you still have a poor dispersion. But when you add some carbon in, you can improve the dispersion and maintain your limiting current. So there, there's, there's two things that people have done, and I'll get to them eventually. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about trends towards expanded surfaces because they're such a a strong direction within electrocatalysis right now. So people have put together plots like this, and this is taken from science from, from um, workers who were at Berkeley at one point in time, but now have moved either to Germany or to Argonne. Uh, and they talk about oxygen reduction and turnover rates. And most of what I'll talk of, most of what I've talked about is oxygen reduction, but a lot of this applies also to oxygen evolution or hydrogen reduction or other electrochemical processes. And what they see is, is that basically they, have, they basically make arguments about going towards extended surfaces. And we know that platinum nanoparticles on carbon have a, a low specific activity. And we know that these polycrystalline bulk surfaces have a high specific activity. I mean, they put things like the 3M version in here just slightly below it. And then they target some of these strange structures. But these findings and these kinds of schematics are based on things that are different types of interpretation than what we've talked about. And there's a hard time interpreting where some of the materials that we're looking at would fall in something like this. It's easy to understand that platinum on carbon is over here, and that's this. They basically explain where the NSPF goes. And then if you look at just a single um, surface, it's a bulk polycrystalline surface or a bulk platinum surface. It goes up here. But the question is, is where do things like platinum blacks and the materials that we're looking at, which we call FX, fall? At some level, you know, you can zoom in on these materials, and our materials look somewhat like the platinum blacks do, in that they're these agglomerates of small platinum particles that you can keep zooming in on, and find that there's a lot of porosity, um, and in some ways you might even just consider these fancy platinum blacks. But the question is, are these materials closer to this material, or are they closer to this material? When you zoom in on these materials, you see that they have this porosity as well, and that they've got size scales that are big as well. So you really can't say that these are single crystal in any more than you can say that these are single crystal. Um, so when you look at what people have done, they've made a lot of their conclusions, and I'll skip this and come back to it, because it'll come around in, in the next couple slides. So it comes down to what platinum particle size effects actually are and what they mean. So the general premise is, is that as the particle size decrease, surface area increases and specific area decreases, and then mass activity can reach a maximum. So basically, this would be particle size on the bottom here, and what happens is, is as you make your particles bigger, or inverse particle size, 
Um, the surface area goes up as you make your particles smaller. And then the specific activity actually goes down as you make your particles smaller. And that means that you'll have this maximum mass activity. And most people have tried to make catalysts that actually fit here. But a number, and, and a number of factors could be responsible for this. Some of these are real and some of these aren't. Um, the platinum sites on small particles are less active due to quantum effects, electronic or strength. So that's certainly true. Um, however, most of these particles tend to be two nanometers and bigger. And there's a lot of debate on whether the quantum effects are important or how important that they are between two and eight nanometers. Below two nanometers, people widely agree that the quantum effects are important. Above eight nanometers, people usually don't believe that they're important. Where they turn on and turn off is really an issue. And then also, because you're making nanoparticles, you have strain on the surface, and strain can also impact the catalytic properties of these materials. The, the next is the increasing low coordination number of edge sites or for the onset of oxide formation. So we know as the particles get bigger, they have less of these edge sites that are at the corners of the particles. And we know that those, part of, those spots are the most prone to oxi oxide formation and that the oxide formation is actually a poison in the process. So the onset of oxide formation with the increasing low number of sites is certainly a true thing. They'll also make arguments about as you change your particle size, you're actually getting different numbers of the 111 phase versus the 100 phase or the 110 phase exposed. And they've done studies on each one of these phases so that they know which ones are the most um, active phases and which ones are the least active phases. However, whenever I've seen work that's tried to basically correlate those two, they, they can't correlate them at all. And then the last is, and this is the one that you know our group does a lot of work with but really isn't widely recognized in the community yet, is on the particle, platinum particle support interactions and the importance of electronic continuity. So both this one and this one are things that I'll touch on a little bit. So within particle size effects, this is really a seminal work from GM in the field of electric catalysis for fuel cells. And what they've done here is they've looked at basically, this is the surface area of your, of your, of your platinum. And so basically over here you have small two nanometer particles on platinum, uh, on platinum on carbon. Here are five nanometer to seven nanometer particles of platinum on carbon. Here's platinum black. And here are things like the 3M materials that have extremely low surface areas. So they get basically specific activities as a function of surface area, and they get a curve like this. And then they can replot this as mass activity versus surface area, and they end up with a plot like this, where they have a maximum in this area. And this is the area where you'll see all current commercial fuel cell catalysts fall. Now, when we took our data from our materials that we've looked at, what we've actually found is, is that our trend is not as steep and sharp as theirs. It looks more like this. And when we replot it, instead of getting a peak where they get a peak, our peak is shifted much further to the left and doesn't even peak as well as much as flat lines. Um, and so a lot of this goes to understanding what the materials um, you're looking at are and making sure you're quantifying them correctly uh, in terms of their activities so you know what you should be pursuing for the actual fuel cells. And so with that, um, I'm going to end and just be more than willing to take any questions that you guys have. So thanks. that specific metals are really specific to trigger certain reactions. For example, platinum is known for the uh, high water splitting, hydrogen yes. solution. Um, then you have, for CO2 reduction, these are usually transition metal compounds and so on. Is there a general rule that one can predict which metal will be active for certain chemical reactions? So, so I mean, there's been lots of modeling. So, so, so like the groups of Norskov, there's, there's, there's a bunch of people who do basically DFT models that basically look at the energy barriers for all of these things. And, and most of them have all gone through all the binaries as well. Because the first thing you'll do is you'll basically come up with things that look like volcano plots and look at each of the base metals. And then you'll try to get to some peak or some bifunctional mechanism where you're mixing two things together. So there's been a lot of screening that's been done for those things. Um, when it comes to different materials or different reactions, I'm only going to be really good at kind of the oxygen, hydrogen ones. And so 
um, and methanol or other types of things. So, so you'll find that people will do things like put ruthenium in with platinum so it will do methanol. Um, and that's based on a bifunctional mechanism. When it comes to oxygen, what they've done is they've looked at all the metals, figured out that platinum was the only one that was stable um, in acid, and then what they did was figure out how to alloy to basically improve it as well. And so um, they're usually really good with models in terms of understanding which metals are good for which reaction pathways. What they're not so good with is necessarily durability. And so um, there's some cases like ruthenium is great for oxygen evolution. However, it's also not very stable in acid at high potentials, so it dissolves away and has problems. That's something that's harder to do. And platinum actually isn't that great for oxygen evolution, so they use iridium instead, but then they typically throw some platinum in because it's an oxide. You know, and a lot of this is, is that if you have a reduced metal, it's easier to do the modeling, whereas if you have an oxide-covered metal, then it's hard to basically understand what your surface is and what your reactive conditions are. So a lot of this depends on medium, it depends on reaction, it depends on pH. And, and so with, there are no good rules of thumb except that for all of the reactions that you care about, people have already come together on some subset of materials where they're doing work because they've looked through some of these things specifically. I'd say that there's a, there's a number of reasons. One is, is that the nanotubes are something that's unique to the work that we're doing and they actually show this level of performance. Um, so there's other materials like 3M's materials that they're still developing and are still very promising and maybe even they're more advanced than what we've done. I mean, we've had this project for three years and 3M's been working for like 20 years on their materials with three or four times the level of effort. So theirs are still beyond where ours are. Um, however, out of the novel materials that we've developed, these are the ones that are basically showing a lot of promise and ability to compete at levels that are very similar. So with, with the sputtered platinum on carbon nanotubes, if we actually, I would love to actually be able to synthesize enough in quantity to test in a fuel cell and get the electrochemical data. The problem is, is that I get enough to get microscopy on, but I, even with the microscopy, uh, I'm only looking at good microscopy on like one percent of my whole material. And so um, a lot of it has to do with what we can synthesize effectively, the quantities that we can synthesize, and where everybody else in the community is. Um, but with the materials I focused on more, we can synthesize enough nobody else is really doing it and they're being favorable. So it's a combination of all this. So, so, so 3M has published work where they talk about the advantage of having them vertically oriented. And basically it's once the reactant gets in, it bounces around and is stuck there until it reacts. Um, whereas if you don't have that, it can bounce away and has a different ability to escape. Um, it's, it's unclear to me how important it is to have it vertically oriented. Some of it is, is also good because it's effective mass transport because if you're just going straight down a pour, it's easier than going through a tortuous path and getting to something. And then the way water builds up and comes out isn't as easy. Um, so it's kind of a yes and no answer. Um, there's problems with having it so open that it dries out very easily, and that can be a problem. Whereas if you have a variability of states, then some parts can dry out and some can stay wet and do other types of things. So it depends on application, and, and we don't really know enough. Catalysts usually perform very well when they are homogeneous swimming around in solution. But as soon as you try to incorporate them on the electrode with one or the other technique, they do not work quite as good as before. Um, is there a practical technique to determine which or how many of these catalytic sites still stay active once you have uh, moved from homogeneous to heterogeneous? So, so um, if a lot of it within the homogeneous solution is, is basically how important is how it orients 
and basically how do you lock it to the surface. And so, so in, in a lot of cases with, with the homogeneous catalysts, you'll actually need like um, a second part of this that can basically diffuse and regenerate or cause migration of charge away or something else. And so ideally what you want to do is you want to take that same catalytic center, like in an enzyme or something, tie it to a, tie it to a structure where the electron transport was facile and you could, you could make it go a lot faster. Now, a lot of the times why that fails is there are so many other pieces of the catalyst that are necessary to be there so that when you try to bind it, you're taking away those pieces, or if you would just try to bind it, you would still have the same problem. You know, so, so, so you can't just bind a catalytic center to support and call it good enough. I mean, if you're doing it, unless, unless you're just trying to do it to mobilize it, in which case it isn't that hard. Um, usually you're binding it to a surface to basically increase the rate of it taking electrons away. And so it, in making that electronic pathway, you actually end up with a lot of problems because let's say in a protein or something, or an enzyme, um, you're taking away all of this organic matter that's actually important for the way it functions to try to create the connection. And so, um, if you just wanted to immobilize it, you can sometimes just stick in something sticky, it'll stick to it, and it'll still do all its catalytic stuff, but it doesn't do it any faster than it would do it in the bulk, and you're not getting the improvements in rates. Everything that I talk about, there's basically a built-in electronic pathway, and that's the important part of it, whereas, in some of these other cases, you don't get that as well. And so when you try to build in an electronic pathway, you break down other things typically and, and cause them to fade. Uh, I'm guessing that that's good. Um, different crystal sites of, of, of particles can have different sensitive um, Do you look at that? Um, so, so different? So if you have like, um, different, different faces? Yes. They all have different catalytic activity. All, all the different faces. Yeah. yeah, and it has to do with if you were to so 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 most of platinum, you know, it, 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 I forget it. I think it's all FCC. Um, but it's, it's all it's it's all, it's all it's all a common crystal structure, and so it's not because the crystal structure is changing. But when you look at the different faces, in one one one, it's the most densely packed, and so the distance between each site is set. But when you go to one zero zero, or you go to one 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 zero, then the the distance between the sites changes, and that's important, particularly for oxygen that wants to come down one way, get on two sites, and then break apart. So when you look at each of the different faces in a single crystal type, you know, so people will take these as 111 sheets, 100 sheets. They do even 1099 sheets where they basically do a thin cut and then they look at the same activities and they can coordinate basically the importance of a terrace versus the importance of an edge site and all of these different catalytic processes and where they show up in the cyclical tamograms and everything else. Okay, there are no more questions. Thank you. Thank you.